to 48 of Replacing Darwin, the exciting world of going through source by bloody source every single claim that's in Nathaniel Jensen's book. Since he didn't do a bibliography, he hasn't added anything on, and I think there'll probably be at most a couple more sources that will pop up. Uh, at the moment, we are going through his magical charts, and now we're into the chickens and pheasants. Oh, let me... Um, uh, I keep on forgetting that I leave the uh, sharing screen of our of our dear patrons who keep the show going. I should like to um, thank everybody as usual about that. Um, it's an amazing thing that some little yokel out in the middle of Spokane, Washington, uh, could have people from all over the world who pony up actual money to um, keep this little program going and moreover the projects. Even when I'm not on the air, we're doing that. Hello, Gregory, uh, our first guest. So I'm about an hour ahead of where I, I may typically bump in maybe at about the midnight time or whenever is convenient uh, once the uh, the signal gets running on. Anyway, um, Jensen's got his cute little pheasant chart here. Where... Um, He's got yeah, 40 some odd dots on that, uh, which is an amazing phenomenon since there are uh, 185 species in the uh, Phasianidae family, which includes the chickens and pheasants. Um, and he has them appearing in like the 1200 years after the flood. I think it's kind of necessary for him to do because... Um, Chickens get domesticated fairly early, so he's got to do. Oh, traffic that I'm in South Africa saw a fr old friend claim dinosaurs are not extinct as bats or pterodactyls. Oh, gosh, no. Oh, my. Yes, that's that's really trampling on a lot of things that aren't properly connected. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> first of all, bats aren't pterodactyls. Uh, we got that right off the bat. Whoops. Here we go. That again, there we go. Uh, and um, in effect, dinosaurs aren't extinct if you think of them as birds. So a section of the bird of the dinosaurs have survived, but all the standard run-of-the-mill dinosaurs that everyone's familiar with, no, those aren't. But um, it is lore. We're going to be discussing that in volume two of the rocks. Were there the various people that insist that there were living dinosaurs today, or that people were seeing them in Cambodia in the 1200s, or painting pictures and doing tapestries of them in the Middle Ages, and that Leonardo da Vinci supposedly saw a live dragon, and so forth and so on. Hi, Brian. Another uh, person on the field. And of course, bats, um, the, the thing that bats and pterodactyls would have in common is that they're membrane flyers and kind of fuzzy. We now ha actually have pterodactyls um, uh, skin impressions and other things where they can establish that they had kind of like a fuzz on them. Uh, what genes were involved in them and how they connect up with what's going on with birds and bats and other things. And birds, uh, uh, pterodactyls are on the uh, diapsid reptile-ish uh, line of this uh, systematics, whereas bats are over the mammals. Pterodactyls arrive by the early middle Triassic, somewhere around in that period. Um, and we start seeing them showing up in the fossil record when they would crash into anoxic lakes and get preserved. Quite small, about the size of a crow at that. Uh, the big monster, supersized uh, pteranodons and Quetzalcoatlus and all that don't show up until way later in the Cretaceous. Uh, when birds are on the scene, giving them competition. So the smaller varieties don't become totally extinct, but they become niche partitioned off in the corners uh, in the shifting continents and seaways and all that in the uh, uh, Mesozoic. Um, your bats, the f earliest fossils of bats don't show up until the post-dinosaur period, although the genetic data keeps on suggesting that they originated before the KT extinction. And maybe someday the fossil genie will come through and they'll find some bat precursors that date back 70 million years. Uh, don't hold your breath because uh, the, the fossils are extremely tiny. The earliest bats you could hold in your hand, they're very, very small. Um, and bats, some of the smallest uh, uh, mammals are bats. Um, 
So they're an interesting little uh, little bunch. But anatomically, no, they're not pterodactyls. Uh, sorry, uh, you can inform your friend there in South Africa that they need to look up more ta taxonomy and uh, get some stuff straightened out. Anyway, um, the part two, which I will make, oh, on the, the, the Jensen and the uh, chicken stuff, he had actually had a couple papers in his book earlier, way earlier in the book, that related to chicken genomics, but never discussed any of their content. Surprise. Um, uh, they're not open access, but there is um, a brand new uh, hot off the press Kimball 2021 um, comprehensive phylogeny of that whole bunch uh, that I'll be putting a link to. And no surprise, there is a fossil record, not gigantic, but still a fossil record for the group. And they go back about 30 million years with um, a 2006 paper by Mayer and company uh, on um, a fossil galliform bird from the late Oligocene of Germany. Uh, which they can identify as the earliest in that uh, uh, group. Um, part two of the show is a, a really tidy, compact one. Uh, John Morris, the son of Henry Morris, the creationist founder. Uh, I'm going through um, back issues of Acts and Facts for volume two of The Rocks Were There. It's going to make sure that there's a comprehensive thing. I'm now up to like, I think, about ready to hit 2017 uh, in the stuff that I hadn't already hit. Anyway, um, I found an article from 2011 uh, where he was claiming, without any citations whatsoever, Morris does a, that a lot in a lot of his acts and facts pieces. Uh, oh, Brian Stevens, yes, surprised we haven't found a bat in amber yet. That would be really spectacular if so. Uh, the issue would be the biogeography of it, where amber is originating from in the fossil record, and uh, whether or not. Um, the kinds of trees and stuff where, where the earliest bats, if they predate into the Cretaceous, are they in the same biogeographical area where they would be likely to hit that? We find literally to be lizards and stuff like that showing up in amber. Um, and so in principle, yeah, a, a, an overly uh, rambunctious bat that slammed into a, a thing and got globbed over by uh, um, the plant sap uh, is theoretically uh, uh, possible. Boy, would it be fun if that's so. Let's ask the fossil genie to come through. But at the moment, we're stuck with the fact that you're about 50 uh, million years ago for the earliest actual fossils, of which they're just the early stages of echolocation based upon the available data uh, that we've got. Um, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me if there were bats um, back in the Cretaceous. And if so, it would mean that for a, that period in the late Mesozoic, we have birds, bats, and pterodactyls all existing simultaneously. That would be neat. And, and it would have gigantic implications for their various niches as the uh, pterosaurs uh, moved off into uh, giantism uh, in this period, presumably niches where the um, um, uh, birds weren't able to develop uh, effectively and bats were starting out extremely small and what kind of habitat they were dealing with. Are, are they in a restricted geographical zone? There's a whole bunch of questions that we'd be um, uh, still dealing with. Uh, anyway, um, this uh, bit that Morris had, he claims without any citations, over the generations of history, neither evolution nor natural selection has occurred among the Kurds who, he informs us, are descended from the Medes of the Bible. And um, so for him, it's all just miscellaneous genetic variety. Well, maybe not quite so much. So there, uh, I um, was scouting around for some things, and there was a 2016 paper by uh, Zarai and uh, Rajimi Maham uh, about the phylogenetic genetic diversity and demographic history of the Iranian Kurdish groups based on mitochondrial DNA sequences, which suggests that there's the genetic components of them going back about 20,000 years. So... That's not a hell of a lot of help for Morris's uh, a truncated version. But, you know, um, why would we expect a geologist, creationist geologist Morris to be fantastically well-versed on the genetic information and the demographics of the Kurds and all the rest of stuff? Everything's got to fit in to that cartoon of the, the peoples in the Bible. And since we're talking about an unbelievably truncated chronology where everything that, that's in recorded history and are the major tales of the time after the flood, 
um, it's only from 2350 BCE on. So they've got not a lot of room to maneuver around in there, and they have to pigeonhole every people on earth to that groups that are mentioned in the Bible. Everybody's got to come from there, including the Aborigines of Australia and the people in uh, South America and uh, uh, all the peoples of Asia. And you get some hilarious cartoon stuff, which we're going to be discussing in Rocks for their volume two, um, about uh, what these people supposedly did and how incredibly superficial it is compared to the actual demographics and the archaeology that's been done, of which practically none of which ever gets mentioned by the creationists. They're, they're skimming way on top of their contrary a little. So that's all going to be fun. Uh, plugs for that. Now, speaking of uh, books, uh, we've got over in the corner our um, Paralogs of Phileas Fogg stuff. I had mentioned last week about the, um, some questions came up from uh, Steve Early, who is a patron for the uh, project. Thank you so much. Um, about he uh, trying to visualize the Damos, the terror ship that Aouda flies. Uh, it's based on another Jules Verne story uh, for the Paralogs of Phileas Fogg. And I promised that I would be uh, giving the information on what the hell all of that looked like. So we're going to have a little bit of show and tell. There'll be links, of course, to all the technical papers that relate to Morris and, and all of that uh, once the thing finalizes. So we'll be spending a little bit of time here on a completely unrelated subject, Jimmy's novels. Isn't that wonderful? So first I'll show Steve... Uh, because I had a bunch of, uh, I do sketches. I'm not a great draftsman. And uh, although I have done detailed blueprinty type things for some spaceships and stuff for another science fiction that I had worked on 40 years ago or more, um, I just do basic, simple sketches to get my imagination structured. Um, oh, yes, yes. For the, yes, yes. The uh, superficial thinking is one of the clear hallmarks that result from the uh, Tortugan Mai. Indeed, yeah, because they're, they, they don't think about things they don't want to think about. Anyway, um, here is the Deamos, my little very rudimentary sketches for the thing, uh, uh, right up in this corner up in, whoops, up here, there we go, um, is the front view, and then there's a side view. I'd added these the kind of bumper arrangements around the side and then did a slightly revised uh, additional sketch over in here where I was making a little more notice about the fins and kind of uh, flattening it out a little bit. I pointed out to Steve that uh, the, um, the design is based on uh, the Proteus that Harper Goff designed for the movie Fantastic Voyage. The interior is entirely laid out and is physically about the same size as the interior that you see in that movie from 1966. It was already a submarine, and I just had to figure out how could I make it fly, and then I added on these airlocks along the side that uh, allowed you to get in and out theoretically underwater so that they would have that aspect, and then had a, a, a top hatch that's uh, effectively in about the same location as in the um, uh, movie version. Uh, and uh, then there's theoretically a, a, a bottom hatch opening uh, that um, is accessible that doesn't figure in that uh, first novel. Um, so I'll show a few of the other little drawings. Um, he'll have already have encountered the albatross, which is another uh, character from one of the Jules Verne stories. That was uh, around the turn of the century that uh, ended up with that as one of the later ones. I made my own version of this. This is one of those classic uh, airships with the massive propellers on the top that, that was extremely popular in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And as far as I know, nobody has ever tried to build one of those and probably it won't work. The vortexes and all the rest. You have things with some multiple um, rotors, uh, the Russian helicopters and a few others do it that way, but this absolute forest of uh, lifting rotors instead of wings, uh, it's questionable that it can work, but it's only a story, so let's go with it, and it's based on the kind of thing that Verne did. Um, and then a um, very rudimentary bit for the Aurora airship, which is the other one the villains make use of, and what I try to do, I, I try to put a little bit of, oh, and then below here, is uh, Thomasina Maker's Kestrel. You will encounter that after about halfway into the book. And uh, we can always discuss that a little bit more. Um, there are human-sized drones now, so it's on that edge. Yeah, um, 
it I've always had a fun time trying to figure out the dynamics of um, uh, what's technically feasible. Um, I don't really bother about the fact that uh, what the gas mileage is on these airships and whether their range is theory. I, I have some refueling issues that's going on, but it's only a story. And I have way more difficult to account for science crap um, in the novel than how to refuel the albatross. Uh, then um, if he's gotten to the section where uh, Passepartout is stuck on the Carnatic, I had to kind of work out some extremely very basic layouts of how the engine room was organized uh, because I have a big fight scene that goes on amongst the railings and stuff. And I had to kind of have a, um, a, a template in my head to figure out what the physical relationships were because I could find out a few bits of what 19th century steamers that still put their main engine systems in the middle of the boat um, kind of look like. But I generally did a fictionalized thing that I thought would look good for the purposes that I wanted of these multi-tiers. And so you would be able to look down and fire guns in particular things. And it worked out well for the drama and was not inconsistent with the kind of interiors that you would have found in that. Uh, as we get into in the second novel, um, we encounter the new style of ocean liner that has um, the engines rearranged. They're still below, but they've, they've moved the, the first class passenger compartments to the middle of the boat because that rocks the least uh, in the uh, water. It's the most stable spot. And uh, first class passengers like to be coddled, so they don't like to get seasick. Uh, and um, that uh, started up with the Britannic, which is a ship that will figure in the second novel and then becomes more and more the standard norm as ships start to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and speaking of bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, the uh, the granddaddy of super giant 19th century vessels uh, will be figuring later in the novels. Um, once you get about three quarters of the way down, you will see the Great Eastern. I was lucky enough to have acquired, I have a model of the bloody thing downstairs that I built back in the 1960s. So I have that and there's a whole bunch of things online where you can see the details of the ship. But this was something that was invaluable for me because it was a cross section based on the ship as it was in 1859. Later on, they got rid of one of the funnels. As you can see, I've got little notes on there pointing out where things were when they gutted big swaths of the interior to make way for big drums that are used to um, uh, lay the uh, transatlantic cable and other things. And it, it figures in the first novel, um, there's already been a met reference to it because the Great Eastern was used to lay the new uh, cable from Port Said, Egypt, down and Aden, down across the Indian Ocean to Bombay, so that the British Raj could have direct cable service uh, all the way back to Europe on there. Uh, anyway, because I had the model and I had these interior details and some photographs. Um, so another teaser for Stephen that he'll be able to see is um, it's, it, this is a terrible print, but I, I, uh, you can find these online where you can see it much clearer than this. This is the bar in the Great Eastern, which I believe was probably taken in the 1860s after it had been converted for the um, uh, cable laying and before uh, it was obviously junked and that. So it, it was a, um, a nice little interesting bar area. You can see right in the middle mirrors that's around one of the funnel casings and way off in the corner in the photograph, the picture is actually, uh, the original is really quite clear. You can see a little tiny little picture that's on a wall. And that turned out to match up with a picture of this dining area that there is the little picture right there that can be seen at the far end of the thing. By the way, this is not kerosene lights. This is a gas lamp because the Great Eastern actually made its own gas light, had its own system going on. And I worked out by the locations of things, I believe that this, whoops, this bulkhead is right on the other side over here would be the great big paddle wheel engines that ran the main paddle wheels of the Great Eastern. And so all of that, that dining area was kind of a restricted shrunken down version to cater to the small amount of passengers that were still being used on this cavernous ship where the sections aft of those paddle wheels, um, uh, again on that um, uh, drawing here, 
uh, boop, boop, boop. there we go. Uh, right here in the middle is the big paddle wheel compartment. And uh, then um, after this, they had gutted large sections of the uh, living quarters to make way for the giant drums. And one section up here was gutted to make way for the drums. Uh, so there were three uh, spool uh, areas on the actual ship after 1865. Um, so... Uh, I was able to work out that that was the location of it, and then I had to do some theoretical fictionalizing as to working out what kind of interiors were looking like. Would they have kept the furniture in place? So I put like shrouds and things on them, and there's a little bit of dust and that uh, stuff. And uh, but all, a lot of the paraphernalia around the uh, funnel casings and things were still intact. <coughs> that would have been the big passenger areas uh, behind the uh, paddle wheels. So that'll give you a little bit of a teaser there, uh, Stephen, for um, <clears throat> the uh, upcoming material involving the Great Eastern. Uh, it was the biggest ship in the world when it was built in the 1850s. Brunel dropped dead before it was launched. It had big problems, teething pains, and, and was a very troubled albatross of a ship. Uh, that never was very profitable and uh, event, uh, and made a little bit of notoriety by laying cables because it was the only thing big enough, 690 feet long. I mean, it was the biggest thing afloat. And nobody built anything as big as that until I think one of the German liners, um, um, Crown Prince and Cecily or something like that, uh, in 1899 got to be that large. And then from that point on, there was a veritable ocean liner arms race as the ships got progressively bigger quite quickly. So they went from uh, the 600 feet to 700 to 800 to 900 uh, by the time you hit um, World War I. And uh, then you finally breach the 1,000-foot length after World War I when they start building the, the big superliners like uh, the Queen Mary and the Normandy and all of that, uh, that of which... The Queen Mary is the only one still in existence from that period down in, I think it's still down in Long Beach. All the other ones were either destroyed in the war. Uh, the Bremen and Europa were uh, bombed out. I think one of the, um, oh no, maybe one of them. Yes, I think one of them, either the Bremen or the Europa survived and was rebuilt, I think, as the Liberté or something after the war. And um, uh, um, a lot of the Italian liners had been lost in the war. And the Queen Elizabeth I, uh, ocean liner was uh, caught fire um, when it was a uh, floating university in Hong Kong. One of the James Bond movies with Roger Moore has some scenes allegedly set on board the uh, that. Uh, oh, <laughs> ah. I tried writing fiction once and found that I can produce copious amounts of completely insipid drivel. Well, I try to avoid the insipid drivel part uh, from my end. Um, I I had had. Um, an interest in writing things before, and I had a big historical novel that I still have vast amounts of note for, and in fact, quite a chunk of the Centennial Exhibition material that's in the second Fog novel is stuff that I had already known about and researched uh, for this old historical novel back in the 1970s. I still, of course, made a point of updating all of that research because so much is available today for uh, layouts uh, ground plans of buildings, photographs of buildings, interior details, historical reminiscences, uh, uh, archived menus from places, and all of that. And so I draw on a vast array of internet available material that allows me to, to drop the reader into a highly accurate uh, physical environment. And I know uh, the, the first Fog novel that I did was in 2016. I could never have written that 10 or 15 years earlier. Uh, and that would have just been the turn of the century because none of that stuff would have been available online. Whereas I could acquire so many things. Um, the San Francisco section is um, a, a delicious amount of period detail that I was able to pull off because San Francisco, uh, I found an 1872 San Francisco map, which I could then compare to the 1906 material that I had in relation to the San Francisco earthquake to find out what was landfill. Um, the, the whole southern area south of Market Street is very different in 1872. Uh, um, pieces of stuff that was landfill that was all going to liquefy uh, during the um, uh, earthquake 
in 1906 didn't exist. Uh, they were t literally tearing down hills in the 1870s and dumping them into the bay. And the only reason why there's Knob Hill and Telegraph Hills because they were too big to dismantle. And, and in 1872, in fact, um, there was only one measly little mansion up on top of Knob Hill. It was not yet the place where all these rich robber barons uh, landed uh, in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, oh, told my great, great, great grandparents sailed to South Africa on the Lusitania. Well, it wouldn't have been the Lusitania. Uh, the Lusitania, as far as I know, was uh, never all, um, uh, on, the, on service other than on the Atlantic. It was designed uh, as the sister ship. I have a little model of its sister ship, the Martania. Uh, and um, uh, it was Cunard's um, part of this arms race of enlarging vessels. Uh, Cunard made a little deal with the British government uh, to make use of the um, secret weapon, uh, whoops, uh, the secret weapon of um, ocean liners at the time, which was turbine engines. And if you've seen the Cameron's Titanic and all that, you'll know that the, um, be aware of the fact that the center propeller used a turbine engine on the Titanic of the three propellers, but it was reciprocating engines, great big honking things. And the turbine only worked when it was going forward. It wouldn't work in reverse. Well, Cunard, turbines were really expensive. They were uh, developed uh, in the late 19th century. I think there was a famous little test ship that was built for the British Navy in like 1897 or so that, that just reached hellaciously fast speeds. And so Cunard made a deal with the British government that if they subsidize these new ships, the three big ships they were planning on building, because you needed to have a three ship service to do a weekly service where there would be a ship leaving New York and a ship leaving London each week on a regular schedule because you had to service them around. And so Mauritania, Lusitania, and then eventually there was going to be Aquitania. Aquitania was even bigger because by then the Olympic Titanic ships had already been built. So they upped the ante by enlarging it. And the, and the, Olymp uh, the Aquitania is quite a bit longer, but it didn't really see service until uh, much service until after World War I, because I think it started uh, around 1914. And I, I don't know that he saw any operational service at that time. Um, oh, yeah, the uh, uh, yeah the water uh, the water turbines. Well, these were simply turbines to spin the propellers. So the propellers were still running as standard things. So that the, the turbine allowed um, a smoother reciprocation, and that's why the Martania could easily do 24, 25 knots without busting a sweat. Whereas the the Titanic, which although it was a bigger ship as well. Uh, was really straining to get up to 22 knots. Uh, so it was never going to capture what was the race car prize, uh, the Blue Ribbon, uh, which was to, uh, who can cross the Atlantic fast enough. The Martania took the bloody thing, and I, and I don't think Lusitania was in service. Uh, it, it, uh, I can't remember whether Lusitania ever actually caught the Blue Ribbon. The Martania was always a tad faster. Um, but anyway... Uh, Lusitania, of course, was sunk in World War I in 1915, so I, I, uh, it's possible there was a ship with a similar name, but the Ia part tells you that it was a Cunard ship. So if it was a vessel like that, and there were a whole bunch of, uh, some of the names were reused, there was a second Mauritania years later, uh, and uh, there were several ships that had multiple names, and if they went back far enough, there would be ones that would be two or three different ships of the same name. You would have an old steamer of one name, and then you would have it reused on a bigger ship, and then it would be used for a motor liner in the 1940s. Uh, you know, they, they, it, they had a long pedigree of a lot of these things. Um, ships that are uh, ending in ick uh, were um, White Star liners. Uh, things that were ending in ia uh, were Cunard liners. Uh, oh, yes. Portuguese name of the same name. Yes, yes. Lusitania, I think, is, a, is an old Roman name for a province, I think, in uh, Portugal. So that could be it. And um, um, it's possible that, um, depending upon, because we're in the 21st century here, it could very well be a ship that, that dates after the Cunard Lusitania. And maybe no one particularly felt like 
Cunard was ever going to use the name again. <laughs> so that's a possibility. Uh, it could be a, a motor cruiser or something that came out in the 1920s. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to look that little puppy up. There's one that you, if somebody uh, checks up on that beforehand, uh, put it in the comments and stuff in the uh, video once it's all uh, posted. So anyway, that's a little walk down memory lane in terms of ocean liners and uh, uh, the technology of things. Um, the the Martania Lusitania ships uh, also had to be built to military specifications, which is why they had all their coal bunkers down along the sides, which made them real easy to let water in when a torpedo hit them. And so that's the reason why the ship listed so badly. Plus, all of that superstructure that was put on top of it to make it an ocean liner added height. So the, 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 the ship was for the period of extremely tall, narrow ship. And uh, that also facilitated its tendency to list uh, rather disastrously. Um, the Lusitania, of course, um, went down practically like a rock, whereas the Titanic took two and a half hours to sink. The Lusitania, I think, went down in 18 minutes, so fast that it barely had enough time to launch like five or six foot of, of, of lifeboats. Lifeboats were being, uh, they were attempting to get them organized and they would, they, they would cut them loose from the davits and they would roll, uh, crash down uh, the, the slanting deck um, and uh, slam into the boats farther down below. It was just a complete mess. And um, the, uh, the ship uh, also, unlike the Titanic, which sank in a couple miles of water, um, the Lusitania was in a relatively shallow area in the straits. And literally the ship Sl the bow slammed into the bottom of the sea <laughs> because it's 800 of, uh, some odd feet long, 780 feet, feet long. And it was such that it actually bumped into the bottom of the uh, um, estuary uh, and rattled a bit and then continued to sink back. Uh, it, it was a um, great big cock up as they would have said at the time. Uh, so, oh, I mean, when the sort of speeds... Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, sort of speeds produced during transfer to props produce cavitation. Uh, the, the, that would be a problem of the fact that, yes, this propellers would be, in order to move the ship faster, you have to spin the propeller faster. And it was a big issue for years and years in ocean liner thing, all the way down into the Normandy, uh, the famous issues of the Normandy. It, it had just a hellacious uh, vibration that wasn't noticeable in the luxury first class, but down in the second class thing, there was, and you know, it, it, you could practically do a melt, milkshake on the thing. And so the 1935 run of the Normandy, they were trying to figure out what the hell they could do. And they, they designed new propellers that had, I think four blades instead of three uh, that they put on the ship for the 1936 season. And that resolved the thing. The ship also, uh, Normandy was so wide and massive that um, and the hull shape was so interesting that it also was relatively resistant to doing this during storms. Whereas the Queen Mary got to be notorious for the fact that um, this and the Queen Mary, by the way, was faster than the Normandy, uh, even though uh, it didn't have such a fancy hull and all the rest. It, it, it eventually took the blue ribbon. By that time, you're talking about going into the 28, uh, 29, 30 knot. Uh, speed range, and then eventually quite a bit faster after the war with the uh, with the United States, which I think still is in mothballs somewhere, uh, the fastest ocean liner of the time. Although I think modern day um, military ships have found ways to move even faster than that, you know, and they tend not to advertise just how quickly some of these cruisers and things can go. But anyway, sidebar. sidebar. Um, anyway, the um, um, Cavitation problems, and they resolved on on the uh, the Normandy. And but the Queen Mary, there were times on some of the the crossings when this gigantic ocean liner was listing like 20, 30 degrees, and th they had to actually start putting like extra railings and things for people to grab. Uh, and and some people actually got a, a, a big thrill out of the thing. You know that they were uh, excited by these um, uh, wacky moments um, uh, that that didn't happen on the Normandy. Uh, later on, then after the war, they figured out how to put gyroscopic stabilizers and things on them, and that cut down the uh, shifting all that. Um, well, the new the latest trick with propellers you can see on the Queen Mary II, which doesn't have conventional propellers at all. 
they have a series of little pods. I seem to think they're like four or maybe six. I can't remember, but that, just, there's, there certainly must be four. So it doesn't have to worry so much about like tugboats and things because these little pods, um, which would resemble kind of like what you would see in the old engines uh, outside of the Hindenburg airship, except these are rotatable. So it doesn't have conventional propellers. Those are the thrusters for the ship. And because they can be rotated in place, they can nudge the ship to the side and do all of that. So I, I think that was one of the first uh, vessels um, as an ocean liner that was really make extensive use of these little uh, pod units. And of course, the, the Queen Mary II at like 1,200 feet would absolutely dwarf. It's twice the length of the Great Eastern and, and is as big as these large super tankers and that are today. So anyway, that's a little stroll down memory lane when it comes to ocean liners. I, I will be informing you as a secret little, little thing that the ocean liner Normandy will be figuring in Paralogs of Phileas Fog 11. And yes, I have figured that far out. <laughs> that's one of the reasons why it took me six years to do the second novel is because, um, uh, first of all, I was working on a couple books at the same time, uh, the science stuff, but also I was working out the third book, which is the other half of the second book that covers the same time frame in parallel, and then the various books after that so that it would have a good, uh, 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 I, I know where the whole epic goes all the way out to the end game for the whole series. And um, uh, the Normandy will be figuring in that in 1936, June of 1936, specifically. That's when the airplane crashed into the Normandy. Edward G. Robinson on, was on board, and uh, Edna Ferber, I think, was there. And there was a Russian opera singer that was one of the guests on that voyage in that as well. Plus all the fictional characters that I will be ramming into the story. Uh, but we'll we'll worry about all of that later. So um, uh, uh, that um, I'm, I'm quite the ocean liner geek, Colton. Uh, um, shares my ocean liner interest because he's a big Titanic buff. Command Cyborg, hello world. Yes, I, I was just, um, I put up the references to uh, uh, the discussion of what I was discussing with Jensen and the chickens. And then um, uh, John Morris, an older article where he was making dumb statements about uh, the Kurds and the connection to the Medes and how the real genetics doesn't support his positions. Uh, admittedly, work done after he had written that article, but he hasn't written anything on it since, so it doesn't really matter. And then uh, to um, please uh, Steve Early, who has been reading the first uh, Paralogs novel, uh, he wanted to see a little more about what the uh, the Damos ship. I got the name. See, the, the, um, there's... Vern did very few stories with the same characters. He did a couple. I think there's a couple featuring this fictional reporter um, from um, uh, the Daily Telegraph. And he, he pops up in several stories. He wrote two stories involving Captain Nemo of where the sequel oddly is set previous to <laughs> first. So he gets the chronology wrong. Uh, and you can spot that if you uh, compare the film versions that Disney did in 1954 and then Mysterious Island. Uh, that's uh, the, the, the first novel uh, is set in the 1868 or so. And the sequel is set during the America's Civil War, which ended in 1865. So Vern just got everything screwed up. Uh, and then there are the Rober stories, Rober the Conqueror and uh, Master of the World. Uh, one of which was made into a ghastly movie with with uh, uh, Charles Bronson and uh, Vincent Price uh, in the late 1950s. Very low budget Roger Corman uh, production, I think, um, that um, uh, doesn't wear well. <laughs> Let's put it that way, even though it had not a bad cast and they, they could have done more with it, but it was extremely low budget. Uh, same thing plagued a bit of From the Earth to the Moon that was made in the 1950s, also a relatively low-budget movie. Uh, I would contend there are only three, and there were uh, um, uh, Five Weeks in a Balloon was made rather badly um, uh, in the early 60s, I think, with Irwin Allen did that. Uh, and um, um, not a hell of a lot of stories done on that. The three great Verne properties that were filmed uh, was... Um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea in 1954 by Disney, and then Around the World in 80 Days in 1956, uh, which is the only uh, one that's a non-science fiction-y thing. And then uh, uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth uh, in 1959, and both the uh, Disney and uh, 
20th Century Fox's Journey to the Center of the Earth has James Mason in it, um, doing his Nemo uh, bit in uh, 20,000 Leagues and then playing a Scottish version the, the, of uh, Professor Lindenbrook, who was uh, a German character in the original Verne novel, but they moved him to uh, Scotland and um, put in the musical number with uh, Pat Boone and uh, <laughs> did a lot, but it's still actually a remarkably entertaining movie. And when you bear in mind the fact that the geology of it is absolutely preposterous, no matter how you look at it, you just put the, put the brain on hold and Bernard Herrmann wrote a just rip snortingly good um, uh, score for it. He also did uh, Mysterious Island uh, with, uh, that was done with Ray Harryhausen and stuff. Oh, looked up the Queen Mary two-handed confrontation. There we go. Um, turns out they carried spare props on everyone, which, which tells you something. I mean, you know, big, big things to deal with. Another fun fact about the Queen Mary, the old Queen Mary, is that the engines that are used to pump the fuel in the moon rocket, Apollo 11, are more powerful than the engines propelling the Queen Mary. <laughs> so that gives you a little bit of sense about how much kick you need to be able to lift a 40-story pile of fuel uh, off the Earth and into orbit and beyond. Um, uh, if you ever have a chance to see the Queen Mary, I think it's a wonderful thing to take a look at, it, since it is the only one of those giant monster traditional ocean liners still in existence. Uh, all the newer ones are built uh, like modules put together in that, even though they can build very, very large ships that way. And, and a lot of them, all, the big cruise liners are like hotels, atrium lobby hotels with propellers. I mean, they, they, they don't have the ambiance of a ship. And it, it was from a different era from when, if you're looking at the Titanic era where you didn't have central heating, you had little furnaces and fireplaces in the rooms, uh, no air conditioning, uh, the, the Normandy, uh, had an air-conditioned dining room, but none of the other areas of the ship were air-conditioned. And I think the Andrea Doria may have been one of the first big ships that, of course, had a big crash and sank in the 1950s um, uh, that was fully air-conditioned. And by the time you get down to the France and the United States and all that in the later 50s and 60s, then it's just necessary to do that. But by then, you're at the tail end of the traditional ocean liner era because those pesky airplanes are kicking butt. Can you imagine a ship that was a thousand feet long like the Queen Mary sailing across the Atlantic with like 60 passengers in first class? There were more crew than there were passengers. It was just humiliatingly sad. And, and the decline was very fast once jet travel uh, kicked in in 1960. I'm, I'm old enough to remember uh, when that arrived with a vengeance to where you move from propeller driven planes that had to go across the Bangor and all of that to come across the Atlantic to suddenly nonstop London to New York on the new 707s and the Convairs and the Douglas DC uh, 8s and all that, that uh, kicked in. Um, so that mood of things, if you've seen the old Twilight Zone episode where um, a 707 jetliner is mysteriously catapulted through time, um, that, um, uh, that one is uh, at a time when jet travel was brand spanking new. And so it, it, to have that vision of where the old airplanes that I was familiar with, the um, uh, well, uh, Lockheed Constellations that uh, Howard Hughes built, which I think is still a god-awful beautiful aircraft, the one with the triple tail, giant propellers and all of that, um, that that then moved completely to the side. I'll, I'll give a plug, too, on the aviation angle. If you can see the movie, I'll put a little reference in here. No Highway in the Sky. It came out in, um, oh, gosh, 1953, 54, somewhere. Maybe it was even earlier, 52, 53. Uh, and uh, it has um, Jimmy Stewart and Marlena Dietrich and uh, Glynis Johns in her pre-Mary uh, Poppins days. Um, and it was from a Neville Shute novel, the guy that did On the Beach that was turned into a movie, the most depressing, exhilarating end of the world movie ever made uh, by uh, Stanley Kramer in 1960. Uh, but No Highway in the Sky is about this um, advanced aircraft that has a fatal flaw in it. And um, it, when I first saw it, 
I was absolutely convinced. I, it was. It seemed to me obvious. Well, that's a fictionalized version of the Comet Air Crash, the jet, the early British jet that had such disasters, and it had a very similar cause: the fact that it it had metal fatigue. It it ones that flew in colder environments lasted longer than ones that were on the warmer runs, and all of that. And this this was exactly what uh, Neville Shute had in this novel that was turned into a movie, but. No highway in the sky was made before the comet jet disaster. <laughs> so the reindeer turboprop plane that figures in the story uh, is completely fictional and predates the comet. Comet hadn't even entered service yet. So, uh, and had not had any crashes. Uh, so uh, it was a weirdly prescient storyline that still holds up remarkably well. It's an interesting little, little flick. He, uh, it was one of the rare films uh, that uh, Jimmy Stewart did over in Britain. Uh, in that period, uh, as he was kind of coming off of World War II and the somewhat failure of uh, It's a Wonderful Life just a few years earlier, and he was kind of bouncing around. He did Harvey during that period, and then kind of got into a second wind when he made more movies with Alfred Hitchcock again. And so anyway, that's uh, either here or there. So there we go. We got about 45 minutes of stuff with very little science, but a lot of history and sidebars on what not to do on doing an ocean liner. If you want your passengers to be comfortable, do not have bad propellers and make sure that they don't do this uh, during storms. Um, I'm able to travel into all of those areas vicariously because of my fiction. And so I find that a delightful thing to do. Yeah, the, the, the um, it, not only that, apparently from what I understand from reading the um, details on it, the actual problem is they had a little window in the pilot's compartment that, so although it, it produced a lot of bad stress, I'm not sure that it was actually the side windows that were the ones that were breaking out. Uh, but it, it, they, they, they made much smaller windows on this and it, and it crippled uh, or it slowed down the British air industry. Gosh, the British were so far ahead. If the Comet had not had those flaws, here they were offering jet service to Rome. They still had to, adjust it so that it could fly to America. Its range was still a little bit limited. But they, uh, the jet crash was a disaster um, that uh, affected them way worse than the thing we saw with the new 737 uh, versions that uh, had such a big problem for Boeing. It, it threw that whole industry for a cocked hat. And by the time they'd fixed it and the new Comet 2 came out, well, it's the 1960 and Boeing has got their uh, air tanker that they turned into the 707. And uh, uh, so if you look at Pan Am and so many, they're buying up 707s like nobody's business or the Douglas version uh, that looked an awful lot like it. Um, and um, away we go. Um, and then the next game that comes in was the move to build either jumbo jets, which led to the 747, uh, in the late 60s, and the parallel track of Should We Go Supersonic, which then was the race between the Concorde uh, team in Europe and the uh, ill-fated Boeing 707 to 2707 that never got off the ground. Um, and um, uh, so I, I am old enough then to have remembered, although never got a chance to fly on, uh, all those Concords uh, in its heyday from, I think they started service in the late 1970s. There was big arguments over the noise they were making and the pollution they were spitting out and all that. And they had to get abatements and there were protesters at, at uh, Idlewild and Kennedy uh, um, complaining about them. Uh, but people kind of got used to the little puckies and, and they are one of the most beautiful aircraft. And of course they had their serious crash uh, that eventually ended all of that. Um, and uh, now there's some new generation supersonics that uh, may be coming back on the scene. So uh, yes, vibrational metal fatigue is a weird thing. Yeah, it's um, it's a thing that you don't notice until you're in the field. And one of the headaches that aviation people and shipbuilders and others all have to contend with, and for that matter, people who do build cars and anything else, is the unintended effects of this vibrating with that and producing a resonance. The famous example of the um, uh, uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge where the cars uh, would just be uh, when the right wind speed. They'd actually done a wind tunnel test at the time when they were building the thing. They, they did tests on it and it looked like it, it was good to handle wind. But it turns out it would produce resonance in reality that produced the galloping Gertie. And then I think in 1940, uh, it just 
fell apart uh, and somebody caught it on a newsreel and it was all that. They, they eventually built a new bridge and so forth. So all of that, um, tra oh yes, trains uh, are not immune from this kind of stuff. Uh, um, I think they had to deal with uh, the piston effect of the high-speed trains going through the tunnel between Britain and France because it's acting, compressing the air in front of it, and then behind it, that you've got a bit of a vacuum, and so there's a potential drag situation going on there that it moves the, the cars improperly or pulls them off of the tracks and all that, and if they are suddenly zipping by, there's a whole bunch of little access tunnels and things along the way, uh, safety areas in case there's any flooding that takes place in the thing, if there was an accident or something, or and sabotage they have ways you know so the, to sequester the zones uh for that and air ventilation and the like and all of that had to be uh, uh calculated into it so uh in anything where you're pushing the envelope into high speeds uh, the same thing with uh when you're trying to do hypersonic aircraft uh you really can't even build a wind tunnel that can push air that fast so an awful lot of it has to be done by abstract mathematical modeling and if you get a little thing wrong there or fail to take into account that little thing over there, um, it can have unintended side effects that you only find out when you build the bloody thing. And it's one of the reasons why, alas, um, most really big military projects that are always pushing the envelope for uh, stealth, for speed, for maneuverability, uh, and missile systems to do the same kind of a things, uh, ships to do all the various things they do. You're always pushing the envelope around there, and therefore there's opportunity to have got it wrong, and therefore what you do to correct it, and the costs are overrunning, and suddenly you have problems with uh, senators screaming down your throat about uh, wasting public money and so forth. Uh, a, a prime example of this would be the Osprey Helicar, that when it works, it's really useful. It's the one that's got the propellers that, that run like a vertical. It's kind of like the albatross of the vertical takeoff. And then the things veer forward and it flies like an airplane. And it, when it's working well, it's amazing aircraft. But it's got foibles and has had been plagued with awkward problems uh, that have led to some terrible crashes. And, it's, and, and they, they're always every few years you get like a um, a crash of an Osprey helicopter. Um, and it's the sort of thing that tiny little maintenance issues could come into play. Uh, in some respects, the same reason why um, some of the uh, sophisticated engine designs that were being proposed as, as uh, replacements back in the 70s and 80s for the standard piston internal combustion engine, which seems clunky, primitive and tappet rods and all the claptrap on there. Yeah, instead, you could have Stirling cycles and Wankel engines and all of that. Much simpler, fewer moving parts, blah, blah, blah. But it turns out a lot of these things were fussy in that they had to have extremely precise tolerances and they turned out to be not so idiotically durable and practicable as uh, the clunky old piston engine, which is why we still see them in our cars, much more sophisticated ones with much higher compression ratios and fuel injection and computer and that, so that the horsepower that you get out of a little itty bitty four cylinder engine would match what you were getting out of an eight cylinder engine of 30, 40 years ago. So, uh, <laughs> are accidents between trains and ships? Oh, I, 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 that's an interesting, I'm trying to think you might have examples of um, uh, ferry boat areas because there are areas of where uh, ships are uh, actually uh, trains are actually carried across bodies of water uh, when you arrive at the transcontinental railroad in the old days in San Francisco uh, it isn't the case in volume one of the paralogs because there was a big spit out in the middle of the um, bay in those days uh, to dock ships with and that's where you actually boarded the train to uh, uh, Omaha. Uh, but um, the the later bit, when they got a little bit fancier on it, they actually would put the railroad cars on ferries and ferry them across so that the rich people in their luxury uh, trains wouldn't have to get off the train and take a ferry boat to San Francisco. They would just be hauled directly over and boop, do it that way. I'm not sure whether there were any accidents and things involved in that area. Um, you've got... Um, examples of uh, all the train accidents I can think of right off of the bat 
would be involving there was the famous tay bridge collapse because that was because of a really hellacious storm and it broke the bridge up when a train was going across it and there were a lot of deaths that way uh, oh one was the scientology ship oh <laughs> oh scientology ship runaway train crashed into it there was a boat moored overlapping a train line yeah yes yeah, that's that i think comes under the dumb effort category of oh this is not going to turn out well Yes, I, I seem to recall that now that somebody hijacked a train and rammed it into something or other that at the dock. I seem to think there was something on that and whether that was the, maybe I'm confusing it with something else. But uh, they are fortunately relatively few and far between. Um, there wasn't um, a direct I'm, I'm in fact, I'm relating to it in the third fog novel because the um, major ways of getting to Am uh, to Holland from Britain were run by um, the British railroads. So you had British railroad lines that would then be running the um, uh, shipping service that would connect you may actually to Rotterdam uh, in the 1870s. And then you would have to find your way to Amsterdam somewhere else. Um, uh, Amsterdam in the 1870s was not the easiest place to get to. Uh, they were just uh, building new canals to be able to get to it. They'd opened up a new canal that made Rotterdam a much uh, to gain access to the Rhine traffic because it was a slightly off on a corner uh, relative to where the Rhine was. And so um, everything was in flux at that time. They were building new railroad station in the 1870s in Amsterdam to account for the new rail lines that they were building, some of which went to Germany, and a few of them were going down through Belgium and that that would lead off to, uh, to uh, Paris and the like. Uh, but so much of the traffic was angled at the Rhine traffic and therefore Germany. Little little fiddly bits that one encounters when uh, I had to answer a question. Oh, Julius Fogg and company had to go to Amsterdam for reasons you will find out about in volume three of the, of the Paralogues um, in 1879. And so how do they get there? And where do they go? And what? Do, where do they stay? Um, the uh, uh, the hotel that still exists, by the way, uh, that, that used to be the place that was the thing where the, the, the night watch painting that Rembrandt painted, the great big famous monster, it's, it's, it's a different location now. The building eventually became a hotel and it's still a hotel, uh, although there was a lot of refurbishing and reconstruction in that in, in later periods. But anyway, I digress like I don't do that. My God, we've got a, virtually a full hour. So all of this is um, uh, a... Um, uh, a, a delightful little nod to Steve Early, who is uh, plowing his way through the paralogs of Phileas Fogg. Let me do a shameless plug before I go then. In addition to the science books, it's getting into the holidays. You have your friends who love to read books, et cetera, et cetera. So why not get the paralogs of Phileas Fogg? Here's the new cleaned up first, uh, second edition of the book with all the typos eliminated. And then hot off the presses, the paralogs of Phileas Fogg too under the Southern Double Cross. You get to go and see and do and explore all sorts of wonderful things. Um, there are electric guns and flying machines and the thing in the box in Chicago and uh, all the other little fun and games uh, that um, connect up the two books. And then I'm um, in the process of, of working on the third book, which if I'm lucky will be out in the next couple of years. So um, okay, cheers, all the best, 10 in time to do some actual work. Um, everybody stay safe. If you've got any climate problems or uh, other difficulties that are going on, wherever you are, hunker down, uh, disease issues and all that. Don't get the monkey pox. Don't get, uh, um, Omicron or any other little variants knocking around, be vaccinated, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and do not accept any wooden penguins. So, um, we'll all see you next week and so forth and so on. And, uh, ending the stream at 58 minutes.